Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Green Left News Podcast. I'm Ben Radford and I'm joined by Isaac Nellis and we're both journalists for Green Left. And we're going to take you through the news from across Australia and around the world. If you haven't heard of Green Left, we're a people-powered media project that's been running for more than 30 years. We provide an alternative voice to the corporate media and centre the voices of activists. You can become a supporter at greenleft.org.au slash support for only $5 a month. Before we begin, we acknowledge that we're recording on stolen Gadigal Wongal land. This land was never ceded and we're committed to supporting the struggles for First Nations justice across the country and around the world. There wasn't much surprise when Labor released its budget on May 9. A lot of it had already been leaked in an attempt to dampen outrage. The budget included a small raise of welfare payments of only $20 a week for job seeker youth allowance and Oz study. The $2.85 a day raise has been described as an insult by anti-poverty campaigners who held a rally outside Parliament on Budget Day and another pre-budget rally outside Prime Minister Anthony Albanese's electoral office. The budget only offered piecemeal solutions to the rental and housing crisis, including a 15% increase to the rent assistance payment, amounting to a maximum of $31 a fortnight, which is basically nothing when compared to the massive rent rises being experienced across the country. Yeah, it's pretty pathetic. There's a a new report that was released by Anglicare Australia that's basically laid bare a picture of the, the grim statistics of Australia's rental affordability crisis. And this year's rental affordability snapshot found that less than 1% of private rentals are affordable for a person working full-time on the minimum wage. And there's only four rentals across the country that are affordable for people on JobSeeker and none for students on youth allowance. The report also noted that housing supply isn't the problem because dwellings per person uh, right now are the highest in history. Yeah, those figures make it pretty clear that something needs to be done about the housing crisis, but Labor's budget uh, is prioritizing tax cuts for the rich and funding for the AUKUS uh, nuclear submarines instead. And these were key issues at May Day marches, which took place across the country from April 29 to May 7. The rallies called for peace, jobs, justice, and an end to unfair anti-union laws. Strong contingents from various unions attended the rallies with CFMEU New South Wales Secretary Darren Greenfield telling the Gaddy slash Sydney rally that unions had to hold the government to account. One of these May Day rallies was in Port Kembla where thousands of unionists, peace activists, students and members of the local community marched through the streets um, against Labor's proposal that the port is going to become a base for its AUKUS nuclear submarines. Uh, Alexander Brown, who's from Wollongong Against War and Nukes, told the march that, quote, the $368 billion bill for a fleet of secondhand nuclear subs is a gift to the warmongers. The money is going to be ripped out of the budget for social services, healthcare, education, the NDIS and climate action. Yeah, it's great to see that communities are organising in heaps of different ways against the combined threat of AUKUS and climate disaster. Uh, one example of this was the Earth Care Cafe that took place took place in Camperdown Memorial Rest Park in Gaddy, Sydney, um, which was organised by Wage Peace, Disrupt War and Food Not Bomb Sydney. Um, the gathering was modelled on the World Cafe concept, which gained popularity over the last 30 years of a way of sharing knowledge and encouraging collective action. Knitting Nanas and their supporters gathered outside the New South Wales Supreme Court in Gaddy or Sydney to support two climate activists challenge the state's undemocratic anti-protest laws. Uh, These laws, which were brought in by the coalition with Labor's help, make it an offence to peacefully block major roads, bridges and infrastructure. And there's fines of up to $22,000 and two years in prison. The Knitting Nanners are seeking to get the Supreme Court to declare that the laws are unconstitutional. And First Nations people, farmers and communities across the Northern Territory have condemned NT Labor's decision to approve exploration permits for shale gas fracking in the Beedaloo Basin. Northern Territory Chief Minister Natasha Files said on May 3 that the risk could be managed if recommendations were implemented and that traditional owners would be able to veto project. 
projects. However, this is not the case. First Nations people, represented by the Nur Dalinji Native Title Aboriginal Corporation, have said that there has been no genuine free prior and con- informed consent process. Traditional owners from the region have called for a halt to fracking exploration and production until proper consultation is done and the combined risks from what will be a major industrialization of their country are better understood. It's worth noting that First Nations opposition is being sidelined by Labour just as they urge people to vote yes on the Voice to Parliament referendum. In Western Australia, work has started on the Perdaman fertiliser plant on the Burrup Peninsula in the Pilbara, uh, despite a whole bunch of objections from traditional owners and environmentalists. Federal Environment Minister Tanya Plibersek approved the plant last August, even though it's predicted to emit more carbon dioxide than Labor's new safeguard mechanism is expected to save, and will also involve the destruction of ancient rock art. Traditional custodian and Nalama elder, Robin Chernside, said she is, quote, very disappointed that the Perdaman project and the rock art removals have been allowed. The Love, Art and Revolution Film Festival was a great success with about 300 people attending four sessions over April 27 to 29. The festival was directed by Jackie North Productions and sponsored by Green Left and 107 Projects. After each session of films, there was an audience vote for best film and a discussion with a panel of activists. Some highlights included live music and performances from the Chilean and Kurdish communities and an incredible installation of wearable art by Mardi Gras costume designer Rene Rivas who made a dress from recycled copies of Green Left, which was really cool. Another really powerful public event um, was this forum that was held in Geelong Geelong, that discussed medical misogyny, which is the gender bias in the health system that's deeply rooted in these patriarchal structures. Researcher Elizabeth McClendon spoke about her survey of more than 10,000 nurses and midwives, which found that nearly half experienced one or more violent relationships since the age of 16 and that nurses and midwives experience rates of physical and sexual violence up to 4.5 times higher than the general population. Other speakers talked about the struggle to access adequate contraceptive information and services as well as the systemic barriers that women face which lead to worse health outcomes. And council workers in Geelong, supported by the Australian Services Union, rallied outside Geelong City Council on April 26 to show support for council workers who are facing redundancies. Funding is instead going to wages for executive level staff. And a lot of these workers who are facing redundancies are from council services that promote cultural diversity and gender equity. And Geelong Women's Unionist Network co-convener Adele Welsh told Green Left it was shameful that council was cutting services for the most vulnerable people including those facing homelessness and family violence when the cost of living is already hitting hard. In other union news, about 500 members of the Australian Nursing and Midwifery Federation attended the union's 10th Health and Environmental Sustainability Conference in Nam, which discussed ways to reduce carbon emissions and the environmental impacts of the healthcare sector. The ANMF is the only union that has organised an annual environmental conference which is the biggest of its kind in the Southern Hemisphere. And university staff took action across the country in Victoria, ACT, Queensland and New South Wales, uh, including taking strike uh, actions, stopping work and other measures as part of a National Day of Action organised by the National Tertiary Education Union. Many universities are in the midst of negotiating new enterprise bargaining agreements and workers want an end to insecure work They want healthy workloads, a real pay rise, First Nations employment targets, gender affirmative leave, and the right to work from home. In Victoria, more than 600 NTU members crammed into the Victorian Trades Hall on May 3 for their first stop work meeting in a decade. The meeting started with chants of stop union busting and no to stolen wages. Yeah, some great news that the campaign's really kicking off there. Uh, While in Sydney, it's disappointing to see that NTEU members at the University of Sydney have 
voted to end their industrial action after a nearly two-year-long campaign for better wages and conditions. Markella Panagiris, who's a casual academic, is also part of the UCID NTEU branch committee, told Green Left that the vote to end strike action and conditionally support the uni management's pay offer was really disappointing. Panagiris, who's part of the rank and file action group that was leading the campaign, pointed to some of the major gains that were made, such as sick leave for casuals, and also vowed to continue organising on campus for better conditions. And a positive note from that is that a lot of the NTU members taking action across the country have looked to UCID and the dedicated action that they took over the last two years um, as inspiration for the action that they're taking in their own workplaces. So it's good to see. Prisoners being held across Australia under Section 501 of the Migration Act held peaceful protests demanding their release from indefinite detention. So the protests started at Melbourne Immigration Transit Accommodation, or MEDA, but they then spread to other detention centres around the country. Uh, Detainee Joey Tangaloa Tawali told Green Left that some of them have been detained for more than nine years and that they're, quote, treated like animals. And in classic Labor fashion, before the federal election last year, uh, they promised to abolish indefinite detention, but they're now budgeting more than $5 billion over the next five years to keep refugees in detention, which is actually more than the Scott Morrison government spent over the same period. And now we'll hear what's happening around the world. In Austria, the Communist Party has stunned many with its unprecedented result in the Salzburg state elections. Running as KPO Plus and headed up by a 34-year-old museum tour guide, K. Michael Dankel, the Communists got about 12% of the vote, up from just 0.4% five years ago. Christian Zeller, who's a professor in economic geography at the University of Salzburg, told Green Left that the neoliberal and environmentally destructive policies of the conservative state government were some of the major reasons for the upswing in votes for a left-wing alternative. In the last episode, we spoke about the third biggest party in the Turkish parliament, which is the Progressive and Pro-Kurdish People's Democratic Party, or HDP, being forced to run in the upcoming May 14 elections as the Green Left Party. And the dictatorial Recep Tayyip Erdogan regime is cracking down on the pro-Kurdish opposition in various ways, including arresting scores of journalists, lawyers, artists, and human rights activists. And mass protests have broken out in response to these arrests. Um, Green Left's Peter Boyle spoke to the Sydney representative of the Green Left Party in April, and you can find the full interview at greenleft.org.au slash videos. In Palestine... Trade unions have urged the international labour movement to take action in support of the Palestinian-led movement against Israeli occupation, colonisation and apartheid. They urged unions to help the movement through actions such as refusing to load or offload Israeli ships, which are similar to the actions that were taken against apartheid South Africa. And they've also called to resist arms trade and free trade agreements with Israel. And Palestinian man Kader Adnan died on May 3 after refusing food in protest of his detention by Israel for 86 days. He's the first Palestinian to die during a hunger strike in 40 years, and his death brings to 237 the number of Palestinian prisoners who have died in Israeli custody since 1967. Israel had for weeks refused to move him to a proper hospital or to allow his family to visit him, even as his condition deteriorated. Uh, He had spent eight years in Israeli detention, mostly without charge or trial, and had gained some limits on his detention over the years with successive hunger strikes, including 25 days in 2004, 66 days in 2011, 55 in 2015, 58 in 2018, and 25 in 2021. Adnan was determined to teach the occupiers a lesson in dignity and defiance. He said in an essay published in A Shared Struggle, uh, Stories of Palestinian and Irish Republican Hunger Strikers, that our freedom is the most precious thing we have. His death was met with widespread outrage among Palestinians in the occupied West Bank, 
and general strikes were declared in several Palestinian cities. We remember Adnan and the price he paid in his quest for freedom for himself and his people. So we can show solidarity um, with the Palestinian struggle. Some of these events will be happening as the pod goes up, but there's going to be rallies around the country this weekend commemorating al-Nakba or the catastrophe, which is the start of the colonial occupation of Palestine. There's already been some events, um, such as at Ballarat Trades Hall, where they staged a solidarity photo shoot and released a statement condemning Israeli apartheid. The armed conflict between the Sudanese armed forces and the powerful paramilitary faction, the Rapid Support Forces, or RSF, that broke out on April 15 continues. Green left Susan Price spoke to Hoyam Abbas from the United Sudanese Revolutionary Forces Abroad about the ongoing crisis. Abbas said it was becoming clear that bigger forces are behind the conflict, and that United States and Russia are playing a big role in Northeast Africa and trying to get access to Sudan's resources through an indirect means. Abbas said that the people woke up to bombing with no warning and that the outbreak of the war is anathema to the peaceful, non-violent struggles of the pro-democracy forces. Now men, women and children are being shot in the streets and people are surrounded by war and desperately trying to escape the violence. Even before the war started, Abbas said, we didn't have enough resources. We don't have clean water or enough electricity, enough medicine or food. 80% of the people live below the poverty line Day by day, they don't have any savings, any food. Abbas also told Green Left that grassroots organisations are trying to organise support and aid in the streets, but don't have enough resources. She called on the Australian government to provide aid and help people evacuate from Sudan. Here in Australia, the Sudanese-Australian community organised a rally outside the State Library in Nam, calling for an end to the armed conflict and demanding that Labor do more to help Sudanese caught up in the violence. And the Iranian people are continuing to resist the suppression of the ruling regime, which has martyred more than 750 protesters since the uprising began in September last year. Nearly 30,000 protesters have been arrested and tens of thousands injured without access to proper medical treatment. Despite this, the uprisings, protests, strikes and street resistance are still ongoing. At the time of recording, thousands of oil, gas and petrochemical workers have been on strike since April 11, demanding their basic rights. People's long-standing discontent towards the current regime that has ruled the country for four decades cannot be doubted, and the protests have brought to the surface the deep frustration and rage that has been brewing under the surface for many years. In South Korea, newly released government documents reveal that the sexual exploitation of Korean women continued long after Japan's colonial rule ended in 1945 and that this was helped by the Korean government and in full knowledge of the US military. Women were forced into sexual slavery during the Korean War for South Korean and US soldiers and were subjected to horrific abuse and death. And late last year, 100 women won a landmark compensation case against the South Korean government for the sexual trauma that they endured. And the world's top four cruise companies have recently lodged appeals against a December 22 decision by a United States federal judge who held them financially liable for nearly 451 million US dollars for using docks nationalized in the Cuban Revolution. The charge was brought using the Helms Burden Act, which gives heirs to assets considered wrongfully seized uh, and not compensated for their property the right to sue companies that have profited from the use of this property. The aim of the act is to put more pressure on foreign companies to stop doing business with Cuba with the aim of destroying the country economically and bringing down its government. We obviously don't have much sympathy for the cruise companies, but should recognize that if the Helms-Burton Act claims are successful, they could wreck the Cuban economy, which relies heavily on tourism. Finally, we'll uh, finish on some good news that in Chile, President Gabriel Boric has announced plans to nationalize the country's lithium industry uh, in order to boost the economy and protect the environment. And this is really significant because Chile has one of the world's largest lithium reserves and is the world's second largest producer after Australia. 
Borish said that future lithium exploration would happen only with the participation of Indigenous communities that are living near the extraction zones and who are reliant on local water basins for their livelihoods. Eco-Socialism 2023, a world beyond capitalism, is coming up on the weekend of July 1st and 2nd in Nam at Victorian Trades Hall. We've already announced that Kohei Saito, the author of Marx and the Anthropocene, will be the keynote speaker, joining via Zoom, and Clifton de Rosario from the Communist Party of India, Marxist-Leninist Liberation, will be attending. We've got some super exciting speakers to announce, including Beiruz Buchani, the Iranian writer and former asylum seeker who was detained by Australia at Manus Island, and he'll be joining via Zoom and Hui Ting, a leader of the Socialist Party of Malaysia, or PSM, and coordinator of the PSM's Environmental and Climate Crisis Bureau, will also be attending. We've also got Sonny Malencio, chairperson of the Partido Lakas Ngmasa from the Philippines, and Farooq Tariq, who's president of the Hakuk Kalt Party of Pakistan. Green Left is really proud to be hosting Eco-Socialism 2023 and to provide this platform for the voices of peace, justice, and ecological sustainability that the corporate media consistently ignores. We're about to announce more speakers as well as the lineup of panels and talks. So head to ecosocialism.org.au to get your tickets. Green Left runs on people power. We don't accept corporate donations or advertising, so we need your support to continue. You can become a supporter for only $5 a month and it's only $10 a month to get the hard copy paper delivered to your door. You can also donate to our 2023 Fighting Fund, which will help us make more content like this. Go to greenleft.org.au slash support to help us out. Remember to follow Green Left on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and TikTok for the latest news and analysis. Thanks for listening. <laughs>